DocuPod, the stories behind documentaries. I just hope more people will understand that the laws can be unjust. And if we're willing to constantly open up our minds and open up our hearts, those circles of friendship and dignity and honor and grace and mercy and love will expand and include more and more people. Welcome back to DocuPod. I'm Tiffany, and I'm here with the directors of Santoria. I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves. Hi, um, my name is Christine Delp, and I am one of the directors and one of the producers of Santuario. Hi, I'm Pilar Timpain, and I'm also one of the directors and producers of Santuario. Yay, thank you guys so much for joining me. I'm so happy to talk about this film because it's so important. The film is about Juana, who is in a church sanctuary here in North Carolina, and what her family is going through because of it, what she is going through because of it, and just how things have changed as Trump has went into office and dealing with ICE. With this film, I want to get started with the origin story. I know, Christine, you saw Juana on the news. What was that process like from seeing it on the news to reaching out to Pilar? Pilar and I, at the time, were both based in North Carolina, filmmakers. And like you said, I saw Juana's story on the news. And I think like many of us, stories of family separation were really weighing on our hearts. But what I thought was really interesting about her particular story was this faith element and was this small church community coming together to offer sanctuary and want to choosing to take sanctuary. And so I think I texted Pilar and said, have you seen this case? And Pilar had already been a part of the sanctuary movement, been very involved. And so she was like, yes. And I was like, I think we should make a film about her. This is a big news story right now, but I think it needs to be told in a longer form. Yeah. And I think kind of like contextually after the 2016 elections and even like some people would say before that as well, there were kind of some protections for people being rolled back who had originally not necessarily been targeted by ICE and deportation. And there is a older practice by ICE called prosecutorial discretion that very specifically was being rolled back around I guess the what we're calling the Trump era. So prosecutorial discretion was when they would kind of let someone continue to stay and work in a country and they wouldn't necessarily go after certain deportations. They would allow people who weren't, I guess, breaking any real laws out here, um, continue to live and make money and be with their families and these kind of things. And that has been changing over time in the last few years. So after that kind of started happening, I think the church movements and faith-based movements began to step up and say, what can the church do or what can people of faith enact to make a difference? And I think one of the things that came up during those conversations was sanctuary because it was a very old tradition, but also something that they'd done in the U.S. before, in the 80s specifically. It was kind of like a movement that happened at that time. And then that was kind of their answer to like, how do you create safe space for families like Juana's and people like in her situation? So that also kind of is just framing a little bit of how we came to the wider conversation. What was your work before with sanctuaries? So I graduated from Duke Divinity School, which is a theological education institution. Um, and after leaving the Div School, I kind of remained connected in terms of community organizing and conversations around issues of justice, especially in this area. And there was a large conversation around sanctuary, really right around the time, a few months before one I went into sanctuary. And I think people again, like the church was trying to find their response to some of these crackdowns and the ways that ICE was becoming emboldened to do more deportations and more raids and these other things that we see in in our state, in North Carolina. I'm not sure exactly what happens in California, but I mean, it's similar um, in that way. So there was a large gathering here. There's a kind of a conference around sanctuary specifically in early 2017. And Wana went into sanctuary May 2017. 
And then that leads us to how long you worked on it. You mentioned that Wana went into sanctuary in May 2017, correct? Yes, and she's still there after almost two years. Goodness. What was the process like as far as the timeline? How long spent filming? How long spent editing? That whole labor of love that goes into it. I think when we first started making this, we thought it was going to be a lot shorter. We thought that it would be probably... 10 minutes and end up on a news platform. And that was mainly because, you know, we didn't have funding. We were calling in favors. We thought we were just going to try to produce something fairly quick. But the more time we spent there, the more that we realized that it needed to be a longer period of time, that time itself is a huge part of the sanctuary story. Being in limbo for an unknown amount of time and how being in sanctuary over time changes you and changes your loved ones. And so we filmed for seven months and then we edited for around another six months, give or take. So we had a complete film within a year and then we've been on the festival circuit and doing other kinds of outreach and screenings for the past few months since October of 2018. So cool. You mentioned funding. There was a handouts at Full Frame Festival and you guys have super gorgeous handouts as far as the movie poster. And on the back, there's some incredible funders that stepped up and helped this project. I want you to not only shout them out, but kind of give us a little background story about how wonderful of an experience that was. We don't know if this film would have even gotten made without our winning this pitch through Tribeca Film Institute called the If Then Shorts. So one of the things that happened at the very beginning when we were talking about making the film is Christine said we should pitch for this event, which is in New Orleans Film Festival every year. And they do a regional pitch where you kind of go and present your story topic out of a big group. They choose a few to actually pitch and then they'll choose one to give a grant and a year of mentorship, which has turned into two years. Thank you, (laughs) Tribeca. And um, we were lucky to win that competition. And so like it kind of set us up for not only more exposure, but definitely more funding in terms of doing more outreach in that way. And so we've been really lucky and grateful to have the funders that we do. In addition to Tribeca, we also received two different grants from the Fledgling Fund, one for production and one for outreach. We also received support from Southern Documentary Fund, which does a lot of incredible work here in the South. Foot Candle Film Society, which is in Catawba County, North Carolina, they're a new funder. And then also Women in Film Finishing Fund through Women in Film Los Angeles was our last funding in and meant that we were able to meet our budget. Oh, I love it. It makes my heart so happy. <laughs> the last one was really cool, too, because we are a group of women filmmakers and also making a film primarily about women's stories and their experience, like in an intergenerational relationship, you know, going through this of if your mom was to be put in that situation and then standing up for her, but also trying to protect your young daughters. So in many ways, we feel like that was a really cool kind of thing for us as a team because it reflected our ethos and you know female dp female editor female director so it's been really cool there has been more funding recently going to regional filmmakers and i think that that's really important being away from the major hubs means that it's difficult to get work done in the places where you're telling stories about those places and so i think that part of the reason this film was able to be made is because funders are starting to realize that and put streams of resources in under-resourced places. And so we're grateful for that. No, that's such a necessary conversation when it comes to documentary films. Like, this is a regional thing. So these people not only need to see it, but need to help fund it and make it happen. I love women in film. And I love that it was all women creating this film together. And you talk about how you guys were able to have sleepovers at the sanctuary and just that bond that you created between yourselves and Juana and her family is just such a beautiful thing because it's mostly women in her family as well. So it's just a great story to hear from women with women all together. Yeah, we're collaborators and we're also really good friends. It's a beautiful thing, man. (laughs) So that leads us to the title, Sanctuary is the English interpretation of it. But 
sanctuary as it's listed on your guys's website you guys did a good job of showing that sanctuary the actual definition is not only just a place for people to go but it's also a definition within the church as well it has those two definitions talk a little bit about the film title and how you guys got to that point at what point did it click i think we came up with the title in the same time that we came up with the film i think i when i originally pitched the idea to Pilar I said let's make a short film about Juana and call it Sanctuary and Pilar said let's call it Santuario but yeah I mean it's the perfect title for the reasons you just listed but I also think what's interesting about it is that at the end of the film after watching it and seeing the hardship of being in Sanctuary it's more like Sanctuary question mark (laughs) because what does it really mean it's being trapped in a place and trapped in a political system and I think that people watching the film will come away wondering what it is. I think that's an important part of our journey as filmmakers on this too because we definitely came into the situation you know through the church and that was our original access point and as we got to know Juana and her situation we just did a Q&A today at a film festival and we were talking about this moment when we realized that she was really sad and that it was really hard and that sanctuary was keeping her in the country but also in a way keeping her from her family because she can't go home and there's a sense of like obligation to be there and to to do the right thing. And she's very much like about doing the right thing. She kept her ice bracelet, which they call it the ice shackles, but it's basically a monitor device that deportees have to wear before they leave the country. She kept that on for six, seven, eight, nine months before it fell off because it's honestly a POS. But seeing her go through that and try to, you know, obey laws, like do the right thing, do what she could. And that's kind of like what Sanctuary seems like is like, a last resort. And I think that that kind of changed also over time for us. What we wanted to focus on went from sort of being about the idea of sanctuary or the fact that sanctuary happens to what does this really look like for the people who are taking sanctuary and how does it feel for them on the inside? Because I don't think they always feel necessarily that they can express that actually, because they want to be grateful. Of course, they're grateful. Like this literally allowing them to stay in the country with their family but also it's really hard and they can't leave and it feels like an enclosure and there's nowhere to go. You know, it's like this difficult situation for everybody. Those feelings and ideas existing within this film are so important for people to see too. It's like, oh, well, she has somewhere to go. Like, she's fine. It's like, no, there's so much more to this. It it takes her away from everything. Yeah, and I feel like the conversation that we want to have happen after seeing the film is like, realizing that the difficulty and the stress and all of this is coming from a gridlock system where they're not able to achieve citizenship, return home to your family, like very simple human rights that she wants. And so it's that kind of moment where people need to ask, even the fact that she has to do this, like, is that right? You know, like in a country, like, should anyone have to do this? It's kind of those questions that we want to address outside the film. Yeah, we say all the time that sanctuary is not a solution, it's a band-aid. And even though it is an ancient tradition, as Pilar has talked about, it's not a legal thing. It's it is just a tradition. And so people are trying to figure out what it means and figure out if it's the right thing for families. And I think that's what we're investigating. Because I know you guys are fully immersed in everything that this film is about for people. What is the call to action for this? How can we help Juana? How can we help other people in these situations? Well, I think like as we were saying, it's really important for people to see that the people that can make a difference on this stuff are lawmakers. Immigration law is a bunch of, mm, I would say, like flimsy laws or ways that they're kind of all directed through these sub organizations. And there's not really clear paths to citizenship for people who have been in the country for 20 years, 30 years, who have children here, who have grandchildren here. So one thing I would say is that people interested in immigration should figure out how they want to vote and how those votes can make a difference, like in terms of 
influencing lawmakers. But on a very like one to one level, we can do something by writing our Congress people, by asking them to sponsor private bills for people in sanctuary, specifically in Durham and in North Carolina. We're hoping that our representatives will listen to us and as we go forward with our broadcast that they could see it and think, you know, a lot of people are going to see this. This is a story about faith and about people of our state and we should respond to this. So those kind of things of putting political pressure, asking for discretion, these things that are being eliminated and rolled back as we speak. Yeah, I think for people who typically lean left, I hope that this film mobilizes them to write their senators and ask for private bills to also specifically target the immigration subcommittee and ask them to sponsor private bills on behalf of people in sanctuary across the country. There's 40 to 50 people that are in sanctuary and and probably more that are not publicly in sanctuary. But also for people who are not on the left, who are maybe more moderate, I hope that this film kind of speaks to especially those of them who are Christian to think about what are our responsibilities as Christian. Being Christian means not allowing husbands to be separated from their wives, for children to be separated from their parents. And I hope that this story can use a more theological framing to to challenge what we see on the news that immigration is bad. Like, no, it's not. So that's what we're hoping is to kind of, is to influence a more moderate audience, a more moderate Christian audience, because those votes matter, especially here in North Carolina, to our Republican lawmakers, and then to really mobilize those on the left. I love that so much because it's, easy in a sense like you said taking the time to write your congress member there's little steps that can be taken to eventually create bigger steps thank you and we have on our website too we've been compiling really from like the first day that we started working on this we've been trying to develop an impact strategy around it as well so our website is santuario s-a-n-t-u-a-r-i-o film.com and if you go to that website you can look at our resources page and there's just lists of resources there's kits there's conversation starters and we're also hoping to do community screenings at churches with people who are interested we also have like a request form if people wanted us to come screen it and in those screenings we'll also be coming with like curriculums and things that we can provide in terms of question and answer ways to get more involved, asking the right questions, those kind of things. I don't want to attribute it to the fact that it's a full woman team. That's the reason why you guys are so on point and have your bases all the way covered, but I'm just gonna put it out there. It's so cool to see a group of women not only create a film, but everything from top to bottom is completely taken care of and you guys really thought of everything. Well, I got to give a shout out again to our funders for that because it's our funders. It's people who supported us. It's people who gave us a chance to bring this story to audiences. That's the reason why we're able to do that. Otherwise, like just Christine and I trying to work on this with no resources or being able to bring in so many amazing people to work with us or do outreach in this kind of way, it would just not even be possible. So we're like super grateful. And we've also been working with Working Films. That's an incredible impact partner and we're really excited about what we're doing with them and strategies that we're working on. So that's a wonderful segue. Upcoming screenings. So we have screenings upcoming in Minneapolis and in Boston. And then in May, we will be premiering on a program called Real South that is executive produced by South Carolina ETV and UNC TV here in North Carolina, but is broadcast nationally. So in North and South Carolina, watch the show on May 9th. And for everywhere else, check your local listings because we will be coming to a PBS station. Congratulations, because that's so cool. And as always, for people listening, check the show description. It'll have all the dates, all the social media, the website, all that good stuff so you can keep up with the film. With this film, like I mentioned before, such a labor of love, what has it taught each of you either professionally or personally while creating it? I think this film has taught me 
a number of different things personally and professionally. It's taught me that I should work with people that I respect and admire and who I like personally and who can really add something to the film. I think Pilar and I both have very different perspectives on the story that were both very important in the film being what it is. And then I also think this film has taught me that while you can prepare for making a documentary, you can't plan. So I think some of the most magical moments in our film, we were prepared for them, meaning that we were there and we had spent so much time with the family that we had this sort of level of intimate access. But what actually happened, we could have never planned for. And it was this really beautiful kind of alchemy that happened and is the kind of stuff that makes us remember why we love documentary. So I think as someone who is a natural planner, (laughs) I learned a lot from that about always keep rolling, always be there, always have your best people there, but you can't plan for what your film is going to end up being. I think that with this film, for sure, ways that it changed me, one thing it's really changed, I guess, would be the sense of how to allow your characters into roles that feel like leadership Mm -hmm. and to ask them directly, is this working? Mm -hmm. You know, once we were done with the film, like I think we did something that people always say you shouldn't do, which is that we showed the film to them. (laughs) And we asked people like, you know, does this feel right? And did this affect you like in a way that you wanted to affect other people? You know, like these kind of questions, you know, they can't be like film critics, but they can see it and be involved in the idea of like, this is their story. While we're still editing. Yeah, while we're still editing, like in a rough cut stage. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's a lot of people who maybe in the past have shied away from that. And I'm not really sure why, because At the end of the day, like perspective is not objective. Mm -hmm. Like we're in relationship with our subject, whether or not we want to be or whether we're put there by, you know, work or this interest in a subject, whatever it is. But once you're engaging with people, this is their life, not our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, it's become our life because we're involved in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's about faithfulness to that, too, being like true to that story which goes on beyond the film and like ask what's next and how do you address that? And a big part of that for us is making sure that the family is like involved in our process at this point, even out to distribution, like asking the questions that are hard to talk about, honestly, sometimes and just being like, how can we help you? What is the way to be involved in this? I feel like those are all ideas until you put them into action. And then that's hard work. It's hard work to do that. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of emotional labor. And I think that it's something that documentarians should be prepared for and also to address in their film planning and ideas. It's very important and I think it makes a big difference in the long term of bringing this film back to a community, not just like taking it out. Now, it's so interesting because, yeah, you do hear that. Even Noah, editor, who won't even meet the subject of a film because she doesn't want to get her point of view interjected into the editing process. But as directors and as creators, you also do have a responsibility to make sure that the story that you're telling sits right with the person whose story you're telling. And so I think that you guys having them involved and letting them see rough cuts is super important and a beautiful thing to actually make sure that they're being represented well because that's the least we can do as storytellers. So I think it's important. So I agree with your guys' perspective, definitely. You know, I think our responsibilities to characters are sometimes different based on what the story is. The rules about investigative journalism and keeping the people in your project away from your project, that's true if you're doing something that's an expose about government. It's true for people in power. It's not true for people who are being manipulated and exploited by the government. Those are the people that need to have a say in what their story is and how their story is being portrayed. Yes, yes, yes. Anything else you ladies want to tell the people? I think that as documentarians, we're just really grateful to be able to share these stories and like 
bring it to people. And that definitely with a film like this, we just hope that people will really take action and put into their minds that this isn't just something to learn about, but it's something to think about how we're living and how we're going to treat other people. And that's what we hope that anybody listening just to think about that and to check out our film once again santuario santuariofilm.com check it out all the social media and screenings will be down in the description thank you ladies so much i really really appreciate it thank you thank you this was awesome yay thank you for everything and as always thank you so much for checking out this episode if you enjoyed it make sure to hit that follow or subscribe button on whatever you're listening on and then down there in the show description is going to be the screenings and more information and then reach out to me just say hi or let me know what your favorite part was i'm on twitter at special says and on instagram it's at special says as well